2.01, which is posted online. Mr. Smith, would you call the roll of the Ag Committee today? Chair Sundin is present. Uh, Vice Chair Vang? Present. Vang present. Anderson? Anderson present. Anderson present. Burkle? Burkle present. Burkle present. Eklund? Present. Eklund present. Hanson R? Hanson R present. Hanson R present. Hanson J? Hanson J present. Hanson J. Present. Cleavorn. Cleavorn present. Cleavorn present. Lippert. Lippert present. Lippert present. Lewick. Lewick present. Lewick present. Miller. Present. Miller present. Nelson. Present. Nelson present. Thompson. Thompson present. Thompson present. We have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, minutes for the uh, 12th meeting of the Ag Committee. Were provided with the meeting material and are posted online. Vice Chair Vang, you, re you have reviewed the minutes. Uh, can I get a motion? Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the minutes for the meeting of February 22nd, 2021. Thank you. Uh, any questions or corrections? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor signify approval by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails, the minutes are adopted. Uh, today is Biofuels and Bio Incentives Day. We have three bills up. Uh, all the meeting material was provided ahead of time uh, and are posted on the committee website. So we can get to it. Uh, uh, Representative Frederick, uh, you're first up with 1433. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Vice Chair Vang, would you please move the bill and uh, get it before the committee? Uh, but before you do so, uh, I think we're going to be holding this, uh, laying this uh, bill over. There's some work to be done, so uh, uh, the motion would be to lay it over. Representative Vang. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I move that uh, House File 1433 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion. Okay, Chair Frederick, uh, welcome to the committee. Please begin. Hey, Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Luke Frederick. Um, I'm here to uh, give a brief introduction uh, of the biofuels bill. Uh, Minnesota is the fourth largest pr producer of ethanol in the nation. Uh, we were the first to establish an E10 standard in our gasoline. Uh, this bill ultimately is designed to support farmers in Minnesota. Uh, and I, I don't think I can stress that enough. Um, there's, there's multiple aspects of this bill. It's not simply saying, you know, uh, farmers are awesome, which they are. Uh, but uh, the, at the end of the day, the, its purpose is to support the farmers throughout Minnesota. Um, there are environmental impacts. Um, I know that it will not go as far as some people would like. Uh, in, in regards to uh, in, to address environmental concerns, uh, there's a lot of talks about a, uh, an electric future, uh, but I do think it is a pragmatic step forward uh, and it is gonna be good for Minnesota. It will be good for the environment. Uh, and I would ask that everyone uh, vote in favor of the bill, but I will turn it over to my testifiers. Who's up first for your testimony? Deputy Commissioner Andrea Vobble. Yes, yes, thank you, Please. Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Deputy, or I'm sorry, I'm Deputy Commissioner Andrea Vobble. Um, and I, I'm so thankful to be here today. A huge thanks to the committee for uh, hearing this bill and to Representative Frederick for, for carrying it. Um, so this bill um, is, is a, a big priority of the governor. Um, and I think it, it reflects a lot of the great work that was done by the governor's council on biofuels the last year. Um, so, as most of you may may know or, or not, uh, back in September of 2019, the governor did um, form the Governor's Council on Biofuels, and he really wanted to look to um, get the state to meet its petroleum replacement goals, as we are woefully behind both in our petroleum replacement goals and meeting our Next Generation Energy Act uh, goals. And so, um, we put together a great team of folks from around the state uh, who represent a lot of different entities to talk to talk through how we can meet those petroleum replacement goals and, and um, 
what are some some strategies to get us there? And um, even through the pandemic, we met several times over the last year um, and came to uh, a great consensus with a number of recommendations that I think are extremely beneficial, um, not only for our agricultural economy, but also for, um, for our, our uh, carbon emissions. So um, one of the other things is the, uh, min the Department of Transportation put out the um, pathways to decarbonize the transportation sector. And it was clear from that report and the modeling that um, we need biofuels to, to meet those goals. Um, we absolutely think that, that the electric is, is part of our future, um, but biofuels is, is absolutely part of that as well. So um, we have this bill, which represents um, a significant portion of what was in those recommendations. Um, we know, we understand that there are some concerns. I think we have been very vocal that we are willing to work through those. This is a place for us to start, but we feel very strongly that biofuels has to be part of the future um, and that this is, this is the place to start. So um, with that, I was gonna have uh, Bob Patton from our agency just walk through the bill. Um, so you get some highlights of, of what it actually does. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bob Patton. Please identify yourself and uh, continue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, um, I'm Bob Patton, and I'm with the department work uh, in the Ag Marketing and Development Division. And I'm going to give the briefest uh, walkthrough I can give of uh, Representative Frederick's bill. Um, it implements key recommendations of the Governor's Council on Biofuels, and I'll note there's a related proposal in the governor's budget that I'll describe as we work through. Uh, the bill modifies statutes pertaining to three agencies, the uh, Agriculture, the Pollution Control Agency, and Commerce. Sections one and two, which are on pages one and three, create new sections in the Agricultural Development Statute. Uh, section one creates a, a new biofuels education and marketing program in uh, agriculture, in the Department of Agriculture, and its purpose is to make grants and contract for services on the topic of ed education and marketing. Um, uh, Section two creates a standing council created of, uh, comprised of experts on education and promotion to advise the commissioner. And I wanna note here that there's no associated funding proposed in the governor's budget at, at this time. Uh, the intent is to create a structure and a fund for uh, for uh, initial funding, which we expect to come from the uh, agriculture and industry groups. Section three on page four amends the statutory authority for the pollution control agency's underground storage tank program rules. It requires all new equipment in the state to be E25 compatible, so that's 25% ethanol. And uh, this should not be a burden uh, because uh, it's our understanding that most, if not all new equipment is on the market is already E25 compatible. Sections four through 13 um, to the end of the bill um, amend the oxygenated gasoline statute, which is administered by weights and measures in the Department of Commerce. It changes the content requirement, which is currently E10, create standards for both E15 and E25. Uh, it makes changes according to a timeline, E15 no sooner than 2022 and E25 no sooner than 2031. The standards apply only if the commissioners of agriculture, pollution control, commerce, and uh, the Department of Transportation determine that certain conditions are met. Uh, two of those conditions pertain to the readiness of biofuels infrastructure, which is really the biggest key issue uh, uh, for delivering high, higher biofuels blends. Um, one of those conditions is that independents and chains of two or less have had an opportunity to obtain financial assistance. And this relates directly to the budget request. Uh, the governor's budget includes $4 million for the biennium for uh, biofuels infrastructure financial assistance, and that uh, also includes policy language. Uh, the uh, I'm going to skip to section 12 that allows uh, sellers uh, one dispenser for E10, and that's of course to accommodate 
vehicles that are older than 2001. And Section 13 exempts small distributors, two or fewer, from the content requirements. So happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Thalman, Board of Directors of Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Please identify yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Brian Thalman. I serve on the board of the Board of Directors of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. I'm here today on behalf of our nearly 6,500 members to support House File 1433. Thank you, Representative Frederick, for bringing this bill forward. House File 1433 includes key recommendations from the Governor's Council on Biofuels. I was honored to host Governor Walsh on my farm in Plato in September of 2019 to announce the formation of the Council and also had the privilege to serve as a member of the Council. It was not easy to reach consensus and policy recommendations virtually, but I'm really proud of the final product and my contribution to it. I am pleased to also testify in support of the recommendations put forward in this bill that will help our state continue to lead on biofuels issues and result in a broad set of benefits. The amazing corn kernel provides ethanol from the starch while also providing rich dried distiller's grain, protein rich dried distiller's grain and corn oil all at the same time from that same kernel. The cornfield where this kernel was grown also benefits from the production and return of 10 tons per acre of stalks, leaves, and roots to the soil, building the soil's organic matter for future generations. The ethanol industry is crucial to farmers' economic vitality while providing multiple benefits to Minnesota's consumers, communities, and economy. Ethanol is a clean and burning fuel that helps to improve air quality by reducing particulate emissions and has lower carbon emissions compared to gasoline, allowing an entire tank of gas to burn cleaner. Minnesota has long been a national leader in biofuels policy. We are the first state to require ethanol blended fuels in 1997 and have made additional strides since then. We can continue that leadership by moving to a 15% blend of ethanol now while paving the way for even higher blends to 25% as outlined in the bill. Ethanol marketing faced huge challenges last year due to COVID. State policy can provide more certainty to the Minnesota ethanol market, using more of our homegrown product to benefit consumers and our economy. House File 1433 can help Minnesota's ethanol industry and farmers recover from economic swings last year. Some may ask if our state has sufficient production of corn and ethanol to meet a 15% or even a 25% standard in the future. The answer is yes. After the 15% standard is enacted, we will still be exporting over two thirds of the ethanol that we produce in the state to customers beyond Minnesota's borders and a move to 25% would utilize more of the ethanol produced here. Thank you for your time. We'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, we'll be holding questions until uh, after all the testifiers are done. Next, we okay. have uh, Joel Borduick, uh, plant manager of the Port Refinery in Bigham Lake. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and uh, continue. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Joel Borduick, and I am the general manager at Poet Biorefining in Bingham Lake, Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today on behalf of the Minnesota Ethanol Producers Association and voice our support for House File 1433. We firmly believe that creating the biofuels education and marketing program and upgrading the state's minimum fuel standard to E15 and eventually 25 will greatly benefit Minnesota's economy, environment, and air quality. Uh, POET is one of the largest producers of rena renewable biofuels and bioproducts in the world, operating four bios here in Minnesota. We are extremely proud of this state's, our state's longstanding policy leadership on renewable fuels, especially the distinction of being the first state to require E10, um, as both Representative Frederick and Mr. Thalman just uh, mentioned earlier. 
a lot has changed since E10 is set as, it's st as the standard back in 97. Um, today, ethanol production is far more dynamic, more efficient, and more sustainable than ever. Uh, first, it's important to recognize that today, biorefineries don't just produce ethanol, as Mr. Thalman mentioned. Uh, we produce nutritious feed, corn oil, renewable CO2, dry ice, uh, industrial grade alcohol, hand sanitizer, and a growing number of renewable products designed to replace petroleum. Um, and we do so using far less water and less energy, um, especially when compared, when compared to fossil fuels. Over the last decade, in 10 years, average water consumption for ethanol production has been cut in half. Specifically at Poet, we've taken water sustainability much further than that. All of our 20 plants across the country use total water recovery, um, which means we use filtering and recycling to eliminate all water discharge, virtually all in all locations, but at our location specifically, all water discharge is removed. Uh, ethanol plants have also cut energy consumption by 42% since 2001, and ethanol is continuously improving in efficiency and sustainability. The latest scientific analysis shows that life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for ethanol are 46% lower than gasoline and could soon achieve net zero emissions uh, in the near future. That can help Minnesota meet our goal of reducing emissions uh, statewide by 80% by 2050. According to a recent report, shifting to E15 in Minnesota can remove 332,000 metric tons of CO2 annually, the equivalent of removing 72,000 vehicles from our roads each year here in Minnesota. Um, ethanol has many environmental benefits, but it's much better for public health. Shifting the state to E15 would improve Minnesota's air quality by dramatically reducing toxic tailpipe emissions like benzene, toluene, xylene, which are linked to increased risk of cancer, respiratory disease, and numerous other health issues. Higher ethanol blends like E15 also save money. This isn't a more expensive product. The fact shows that E15 saves drivers three to 10 cents per gallon every time you fill up. So shifting Minnesota's fuel standard from E10 to E15 would set a level playing field for all fuel retailers. Retail adoption of E15 is easy and affordable, and it's a transition that has already started across Minnesota. In most cases, existing E10 infrastructures can accommodate E15. Both the major gasoline dispensing manufacturers, Wayne and Jobarco, they already warranty equipment up to E15. And last but equally important, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota's fuel standard shifting to higher ethanol blends will support the farms, rural jobs, economic growth across Minnesota. Predictable demand growth for E15 would also support thousands of good paying green jobs, attract new capital investment and generate additional tax revenues in rural communities across Minnesota and our state. The Minnesota Ethanol Producer Producers Association extends our thanks to the sponsors of this important forward-thinking legislation, and we respectfully ask members of the committee to support House File 1433. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Gary Wordish with the Minnesota Farmers Union. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman and uh, committee members. I'm Gary Wordish. I'm president of the Minnesota Farmers Union. And, uh, and Farmers Union, we're a grassroots organization representing farmers and rural communities. And I also assist, assist my son in his farming operation. I just wanna reinforce what's previously, previously been said, but uh, you know, when Minnesota passed the bill in 1997, it was also one of the best economic development tools that we've had in the state of Minnesota. The economic activity to the state has really been a huge benefit. You know, the ethanol program, it not only provides the farmers a market for their, their product, but a lot of good paying jobs in rural communities. You know, by moving to an E15 standard, the previous testifier mentioned about remove, removing the, uh, harmful toxins from the air or from the fuel, in, which ends up in the air, which we all breed. And I think, you know, with the, what we're experiencing now with the pandemic that's been going on for a little over a year now, all the harmful effects of that, we can't stress in, enough the importance of cleaning up our air when that, that's gonna be a benefit to all, all, all consumers throughout the state. So, you know, higher blends of ethanol is just a win-win. It's a win for farmers. It's a win for consumers by lowering the price at the pump. And it's also a win for everybody in cleaning up the air and breathing, you know, 
less so the harmful toxicians. It really reduces our reliance on fossil fuels. So I, you know, it's a, I just want to thank uh, Representative Frederick for bringing the bill forward, and uh, we we are strongly Farmers Union. We're strongly in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wordish. Uh, next up, we have Kevin Papp with the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Please identify yourself and uh, continue. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Papp. My wife, Julia, and I own and operate a fourth generation farm in Blue Earth County. I'm president of the Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation, general farm organization made up of 78 county farm bureaus with nearly 30,000 members. You know, climate and weather affect every one of us. But farmers not only pay close attention to our climate and weather, we're dependent on it to be successful. Minnesota Farm Bureau members want to be part of the solution to reduce emissions. Minnesota Farm Bureau members want to do our part to protect the soil, air, and water. Climate solutions are a priority at the local, state, and national level with Farm Bureau. Policies addressing climate change must support agriculture producers and the rural communities by advancing economical, sustainable, environmentally smart practices. You know, Minnesota is a leader in renewable fuels. Let's build on our history and be the first state to move to a year-round E15 standard that enables farmers to do our part in growing and producing a cleaner burning, higher octane fuel that reduces greenhouse gases. Increased use of renewable fuels by moving to an E15 standard is the fastest way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our state. It is something we can and we should do as soon as possible we are in full support of this bill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Papp. Uh, next up, we have Timothy Gross, Executive Director of the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. Uh, please identify yourself and continue. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Tim Gross. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. We re represent the 450 licensed fuel distributors found across our state who own and operate the majority of convenience stores. Uh, we are the multi-generational family uh, businesses and farm co-ops that supply the energy needs to Minnesota farmers. <clears throat> MP and, and, and PMA supports the increased use of higher biofuel blends. We believe higher, higher biofuel blends will play a very important role in the future of liquid fuels. That being said, we have some very serious concerns with this bill under its current language. Our issues center around our underground storage tank systems. Per EPA and MPCA rules, we cannot store or sell any product above E10 without demonstrating our equipment is compatible. This is done by UL listing and manufacturer certification. This is black and white. We cannot and do not have the freedom to demonstrate compatibility with statements like the equipment is probably okay or would most likely work. Information provided in the Governor's Biofuel Council included that 3,500 regulated, regulated UST facilities are found in Minnesota. Approximately 85 of those cannot demonstrate compatibility with the higher biofuel blends greater than E10. The length of time uh, required to demonstrate compatibility would be a minimum of, of, of 10 years at a current cost of 771 to $784 million. Our main concerns with the bill are fairly straightforward. One per line 4.32, the timetable for the effective date is unrealistic at July 1st, 2022, resulting in a majority of our members with two choices, break the law or choose to go out of business. Number two, there's no direct funding with this bill to help retailers with the $784 million price tag. And number three, lines 6.18 through 7.5 are an attempt to, to build some safeguards for my retailers, but they fall well short of their good intentions. The decisions, of the, safeguard, the decisions of the safeguards are put in the hands of four agencies with subjective measurements with terms like has had adequate time or has been afforded a reasonable opportunity. No business, retailer, or farmer could operate under such uncertainties. Also, an exemption is made to my smallest members. This does not help those, these retailers, but puts them at even more severe competitive disadvantage they find themselves today. 
with price differential between three and 29 cents per gallon between E10 and E15. These small retailers are the ones that need E15 now, not to be exempt. The results of these safeguards would be business uncertainty, financial hardship for many, for many leading to closure, EPA, MPCA enforcement actions, and for the smallest retailers, business closures due to competitive disadvantage. These closures would provide less competition and higher consumer prices and less consumer choice. So uh, in conclusion, these bills need to address three simple areas. First, a timetable that reflects a, a realistic timetable providing a minimum of 10 years. Second, any biofuel minimum standard needs to be directly tied to stable annual funding support covering this $784 million cost. All, the all that benefit from the increased use of higher biofuel blends should help in this funding, including the, tank re the retailers, tank owners, farm groups, biofuel producers, environmental groups, fuel consumers, and Minnesota citizens as a whole through direct state and federal programs. And third, there cannot be exemptions for any retailer or tank owner, putting them outside of this process. We all need, they, they all need to be given equal time and funding support to offer biofuel blend, blended fuels so even the smallest rural retailer can be given the opportunity to be successful. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Rudnicki. Please identify yourself and uh, continue. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Sundin and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Timothy Rudnicki, and I represent the Minnesota Biofuels Association. It's an organization that uh, 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 serves ethanol producers in Minnesota. And I think more importantly, we actually have producers that uh, uh, account for about uh, 700 million gallons of production in the state. And also um, we serve at the interface between ethanol producers, fuel wholesalers and fuel retailers. So we have somewhat of a, a different perspective and vantage point from which to understand um, the role of ethanol in the state of Minnesota. I'm gonna keep my remarks short uh, because some of the points uh, were raised by other testifiers. But I think what's important here is I want to affirm that Minnesota Biofuels Association supports the work of Representative Frederick and House File 1433. Um, we, we think that's important to get on the record because the bill generally reflects uh, the recommendations of the Governor's Council on Biofuels. I think more importantly, uh, this is actually a bill that holds great potential to boost uh, Minnesota's economy and further reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector. Um, and I, I think one point that may have a tendency to get somewhat overlooked, uh, but has been raised already is this notion of infrastructure. And while we applaud the Governor's Council on Biofuels and its recommendations to move toward a, a higher standard and uh, the recognition that there needs to be uh, a council of sorts to create a, a more uh, sustained funding source for biofuel storage and infra infrastructure, uh, there's an urgency here that needs to be addressed today. And I have some more detailed remarks regarding another bill, and that's House File 354. Uh, the key point is um, it's great to talk about this vision. Uh, the reality is we have an urgent need now, and our concern is that this, is, this is, has the potential to get pushed down the road another year and another year, and that has a great adverse uh, potential for not only the uh, ag community in rural Minnesota, but also consumers and uh, also the environment uh, because of the greenhouse gas potential that we're, greenhouse gas emission potential reduction we're missing. So um, thank you uh, for your attention, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rudnicki. Are, are there any questions for the testifiers from the committee? Uh, we have a hand up. Uh, Representative Hansen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, thank you the folks who have testified. My questions are on uh, the structure of ethanol companies, and um, because you're asking for a great deal of money I guess a few, th I noted that the Corn Growers Association was 
6,500 people in a state of 5 million people. Uh, and each representative represents about 40,000 people to date. Um, what is, what's the structure of the companies? Are they all privately held? Are they closed co-ops? Um, what's the demographic uh, breakdown? Uh, uh, are there people of color who are members or owners of the of the ethanol companies? How is the outreach to underserved communities? Just maybe, and I know that's a lot to ask for, but uh, generally, uh, how how does the how does the uh, structure work for the industry? And I realize there's a variety of models. Representative Hansen, were you uh, directing your question towards uh, one specific testifier or is that an open question? That's an open question. I think Poet could maybe describe how they're structured but uh, and the ethanol, various ethanol industries on whether they're farmer member, closed co-ops, open co-ops, uh, uh, investor owned um, private entities that, that would be helpful. Mr. Bedarik, uh, would you like to take that one on? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Or Representative Hansen, uh, Poet R4 Bio is in Minnesota. Um, each are kind of a unique setup. Poet is a private company, um, but there are farmer owners at different bios. Uh, each is set up a, a little bit differently. Um, but each bio does have, there are different bios that do have uh, farmer ownership. Representative Hansen? And uh, are the, is that, what's the percentage of female owners or <clears throat> uh, persons of color, underserved communities, tribal members? Uh, you know, as a, as a house, we are trying to look at uh, equity and how do we make sure that it is one Minnesota for everyone. And I'm just concerned if we're uh, only providing uh, financial support here for uh, a small, narrow, uh, thing, how, how do you work at incorporating and invigorating uh, more ownership uh, if it's possible? I mean, are these, are these closed? Does everybody own it already? Or uh, can, can people buy into the company? And maybe not just Poet, but uh, some of the others could answer. Mr. Bedard, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hansen, um, I, Probably I'm not in a position where I can answer that intelligently. Um, I uh, could answer more specifically uh, towards my biorefinery. Um, but is that something um, I can return an answer to? Can I get an answer and get that in front of this committee? Mr. Bedard, could we welcome any uh, written uh, testimony at any time, please. Mr. Chair, this is Brian Thalman. Could I make a couple comments? Go ahead, Mr. Thalman, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hansen. I can speak on behalf of one of our 20 plants in the state, and that's Heartland Corn Products at Winthrop, Minnesota. I have been on the board of directors there for 15 years. We are a farmer member owned uh, cooperative with over 900 members, and we have a, a wide variety of members. Uh, they're all ag producers, uh, you know, men and women of, of Southern uh, Minnesota in general. The, the bigger part of this picture though, to me is not looking at the specific ethanol plant. It's looking at the product being produced from the ethanol plant. And we're currently talking about ethanol being produced in the corn uh, producing facilities because that is the, the highest, uh, the most economical way to do it in an in environmentally friendly way. As we move along, there are opportunities to produce ethanol from other biofuels. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving on the Biofuels Council with uh, one or two individuals from the timber industry. They have got ideas to use some of the waste products from some of our northern regions, which would probably get us up closer to, you know, maybe serving some of the other uh, people in the state. To me, we're going to have multiple ways to produce a product, but it's going to be the end result of the product we're producing that's going to benefit every single citizen in the state, no matter uh, where they live, where they come from. Uh, but improving the environment for everyone is really how we feel the biofuel industry is going to come forward, and that's going to be the benefit to, to all, all citizens. Thank you, Mr. Thalman. Uh, Representative Hansen, any yeah, further follow up? A quick follow-up. Uh, I got on my my text this morning from Farm Journal. Price bushel March 21 was five dollars and fifty cents a bushel. 
So I'm, I'm concerned on how ethanol works out at that. I think soybeans were above $13. I, I realize it's different from the terminal to the, uh, to the local uh, uh, site, but uh, it would seem there'd be some concerns on feed costs for livestock, uh, uh, acres going in are coming uh, into production that hadn't been in production. Uh, all of those things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering on the math on this, then uh, in addition to the uh, federal uh, money that comes in for corn production, I, I, I appreciate the earnestness and the eagerness of everyone who's testified, but Minnesota is not the same as it was in 1997. It's, 2021 and there's a lot of uh, a lot of needs out there and particularly with COVID and a big financial ask is a big financial ask. Um, and so I just I think there's some concerns Mr. Chair with this and the other bills I, uh, I think it's important to lay those over uh, to work on them and to see how we can best uh, uh, use our resources. Uh, did Mr. Rudnicki uh, care to respond? Uh, just a brief uh, comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Representative Hansen, uh, we'd be glad to provide you with more uh, demographic information, but I, I think uh, we can tell you that a number of plants are truly farmer-owned co-op models. Others are LLCs. Uh, there are a variety of different uh, organizational methods. Uh, Gene McCurdy uh, happens to run the largest ethanol plant in the state of Minnesota. And it's also one of the most uh, technologically advanced in terms of water reuse, energy recapture. But I I've given a thought to the question you raised, though, why any financial support? And as a taxpayer, I'd be scratching my head, too. And I, I, I was going to reserve this actually for comment on House File 354, but it, it comes down to something pretty basic to me, and that is, if you want to do immediate greenhouse gas reduction uh, with the rolling stock that's on the highway right now, the easiest thing we could do is to make available to Minnesota consumers E15. And I'd be glad to provide you with the research from the Energy Resources Center in, at the University of Illinois, Chicago. But Dr. Stephen Mueller has really examined this. And the long story short is if E15 were the standard, um, we'd have 1.07 million metric tons annually reduced. If you go from E10 to E15, the delta is 358,000 tons. Uh, somebody had mentioned the number of equivalent vehicles that's taken off the road. According to his calculations and the EPA calculator, that's about 75,000 vehicles. And I was asking myself, what could you do with $17 million? Because that's what's in, in the House File 354. $17 million gets you almost to the point of market penetration for E15 where you're going to have more diverse use of this lower carbon fuel. Um, if you multiply 20,000, uh, assuming that's what an EV uh, would cost, you're talking more than a billion dollars. So from a, a social welfare and environmental a health perspective and from you know just trying to deal with the, the existential threat of climate change, it, it's, it's a lot of money given all the pressing social challenges we're dealing with, but it, it seems like a, a small investment for much longer returns. And, and I'm more than happy to provide you with more metrics. Um, um, I, I know there are a lot of other things you want to discuss at this meeting today. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Rudnicki. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Wordish uh, for some brief comments and we have two more uh, uh, hands up. So let's move along briskly, please. Yeah, I'll be brief. I just want to point out, uh, uh, Miss uh, Gary Ward is president of Minnesota Farmers Union. I, I just want to point out the the health benefits as we, you know, increase the amount of ethanol by by also reduces the amount of toxins toxins in the uh, gasoline that we breathe. That the huge benefit of that is going to be in the heavy metropolitan cities where you have the densely densely populated areas where you need know, a lot of traffic and a lot of exhaust fumes. So. You know, it'll be a benefit to all the whole estate, but those those areas would be the ones that would really have the benefit right now of um, increased health benefits. So we're out in the open, we're in the rural. We don't we have cities that we have only you know very sparsely populated. But so I, I just wanted to point that out briefly. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Burkle, please. Thank you, Chair Sandine. Before I ask my question, could you confirm for me we are laying this bill over? Is that correct? That's true. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, so my question first is for, for Deputy Commissioner and possibly um, maybe Mr. Papp and Mr. Wardish, but um, could, you, could you give me a little clarification on how uh, the Governor's Council on Biofuels was put together and I mean, my, my concern is that there seems to be very little livestock representation. I know Farm Bureau and Farmers Union would, would cover some of that ground, but um, given the, uh, the need, the ethanol industry and, and the corn and soybean growers are looking for, for a level playing field. And while I appreciate the need for certainty and predictability in markets, um, I can attest personally to the fact that volatility created by these mandates uh, for the livestock industry is hard to pass along to consumers. And in uh, my situation in particular, in a, in a small co-op marketing poultry, um, it, it can be detrimental beyond people's understanding uh, for feed costs. So I'll, I'll chime in with Representative Hansen's comments about feed costs. And so given we can't control weather and droughts happen, I'm just curious how much conversation was had on the council uh, about livestock's uh, and I'm, and I'm talking about this beyond DDGs. Uh, I think we all know what DDGs add to the, to the feed mix, but um, I'm just curious uh, if there was any conversation from livestock's perspective and maybe Deputy Commissioner could comment first and, and maybe Farm, Farm Bureau and Farmers Union. Commissioner Bobble, please. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Burkle. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of speak to how the, the council came about and, and the representation and then I, I see um, We've got two of our members here um, who, can, who can speak to, to the more specifics. Um, so what we did was we did uh, an open request through the Secretary of State's office and asked people to apply. Um, we did require in the executive order, we wanted folks to who represented transportation, um, environmental groups, um, farm organizations, we tried to, to get a whole host of folks to, to represent a lot of different interests. I will say from what I recall, and I'd have to just double check, I don't recall anybody from the you know, livestock industry specifically applying, um, but we, we know that our general farm organizations have a lot of expertise in this area um, and represent a lot of livestock farmers. So we felt really confident and, and good in, in the representation that was there um, for, from those organizations. So that's how it was set up. It was an, an open open appointments process. And um, we tried to, to have some, um, just uh, look at where folks were in the state um, and make sure that we had a, a lot of uh, diverse voices at the table. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Beckland. Oh, Mr. Chair, I think um, if, if, I think Mr. Papp or Mr. Wordish wanted to maybe speak to the, to Mr. Burkle's question. Uh, that'd be fine if they keep it brief. This is Kevin Papp, I will be brief. Uh, you know, sustainability is so important to all of us. It's important to us in agriculture, but probably the most important sustainability is generational sustainability. That ability to have that fifth and sixth generation. And mm -hmm. one way to do that is to add value to the commodities that we grow. We do that with, with biofuels or renewable fuels, ethanol and biodiesel, but also with livestock. And livestock is, is very important, not only to add value to our, our crops, our, our farms, but also our rural communities. So that's something I think we all want to look at. Uh, certainly having those opportunities um, it's important that we keep in mind that the price of corn is an expense for some and an income for others. And, and that's why we've got to be real clear as we looked at prices, the um, futures prices. Uh, remember, my corn is worth uh, $1.12 less in this fall and $1.81 on soybeans um, this fall um, than it is right now. So as we look at prices, we want to make sure we look at which crops. Thank you. Certainly, anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, very Mr. Wordish, well, please. Yeah, I'll chime in a little, very brief. Uh, you know, we, we experienced a lot of the food versus fuel debate back in, I think it was like, uh, 2012, or whenever we had the last price ri rise in uh, commodities. But if you look back over history, 
and even that time, the price of corn it led the market that time, but it was due to so, about a two or three year extensive drought through the I states. So we had re reduced supplies. You go back through history, the times we've had big market prices for our commodities, especially the feed commodities, it's always been due to drought related uh, issues or uh, weather problems throughout the world. Uh, you know, ethanol does help, it gives us a market, but it, it's not the, you know, the weather is the big driver on the price commodities, so. Uh, Chair you. Sandina, I, I'd like to comment on that. Representative Burkle, please. I'll be quick. Um, I understand that droughts do affect markets in that way. The point I'm making is we can't necessarily affect the weather, but mandates skew markets. And in that situation, what I'm, what I'm looking for as this bill is laid over is a conversation about protecting livestock in the worst case scenario. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Thank you. Representative er Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, first off, I applaud the uh, corn growers and other ag groups for looking for value add. I, grew, I worked in the paper industry where they always had to look for value added products to make it profitable. So I understand where you're going. My question is probably for Mr. Patton, and then I'll have a comment afterwards. And uh, Mr. Patton, did the, did the council determine how long it would take our retailers to be, be able to come into compliance with this? And then I'll, I'll I'll have a statement after your after your question after your answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative. Uh, there was an estimate uh, made by the Pollution Control Agency, and Nate Blazing is on the meeting, and he can speak to that if if you want more detail. Uh, but there in there was a lot of discussion. Uh, about the time frame and uh, there, the estimate with the current supply essentially of uh, equipment contractors and the current equipment uh, supply was estimated to be 10 years or more. Um, but of course, those supplies could change uh, with uh, changes in demand. Thank you, uh, Representative Eklund. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, that, therein lies my concern. In uh, District 3A that I represent, there's probably, I can only probably think of maybe one or two chain gas stations where, where, we, where they're a national retailer. The vast majority of them are mom and pops. And I'll give you an example. In International Falls, there's, I'm not going to use the name of the station, but there's a station that's going to change over from a chain because somebody else is going to build a new one virtually across the street, same, same brand. So the person that's losing that brand if they're forced to upgrade at X amount of dollars when the new place is being built and going to be built up to standards and E15 is potentially less or looks, it looks like it's going to be less, that old station is probably going to lose most of its customers because I know where I'm going if it's 25 cents less a gallon. So I think we need to worry about building up some kind of robust uh, grant system for our retailers because I'd hate to see the mom and pops in District 3A go out of business for something like this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Eklund. Uh, uh, so as a result of the discussions today, House File 14. Hey, Mr. Chair, can I just can I just answer really quickly? Excuse me, uh, uh, Commissioner Bobble. I, we need to be brief. Okay. Be brief, okay. please. All right. Well, I'll, well go ahead. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'll be catch you later. Okay, thank you. House File 1433 is laid over. Uh, uh, oh. Next up, uh, we have uh, the Anderson bill, House File 354. You got the wrong number, man. Uh, Representative Anderson, House File 354, Spark Ignition Motor Fuel Wholesalers. Sailors. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would like to uh, move House File 354 for possible inclusion in the Ag Finance Omnibus bill. Great. Uh, Go ahead with your testimony. Well, Mr. Chair, we also have a DE amendment, so let's uh, let's also move that to get the bill in the shape that uh, we have come up with to give the bill its best chance of moving forward. Okay, uh, you just move, uh, you're moving the A21 amendment? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, any discussion on that explanation? Well, uh, I think Representative Eklund made, a, made an excellent point and uh, this bill I think addresses what the, the concern he has in terms of helping our smaller retailers uh, compete in this potentially new marketplace. Uh, the reason we made the DE amendment to the original bill 
is to address the, the exact thing that he brought up. And uh, what, what the amendment does is it, it provides a scale up uh, incentive program and helps the smaller retailers with a higher percentage of, of cost share than it would a larger retailer. And this bill uh, does put a cap of uh, up to 15 locations uh, to qualify for this program. But again, we're trying to help uh, the smaller operations, I like to call them the mom and pop operations with the uh, uh, efforts to scale up and to come up to code and to do it correctly with uh, the handling of E15 uh, petroleum. Okay, uh, now that we have the uh, E21 amendment uh, before us, uh, any questions to that? We've heard the motion, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. Uh, uh, the bill is uh, in the form the author would prefer. Uh, you have testimony from a couple of people that we're familiar with. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, we don't need to belabor the point. I think there seems to be consensus that E15 would be a good move for Minnesota. The Governor's Council on Biofuels said that uh, MnDOT even in their report on decarbonizing transportation said that we need to have a uh, a program that would provide technical assistance and financial support to offer ethanol blends higher than, than 10%. And that's what this bill does. It, it gets at, at the real, I think, the problem with moving ahead with this, and that is providing funding to help build up the infrastructure for uh, stations to handle E15 if, in fact, they have to make upgrades. So with that, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd like to hear from our testifiers. Okay, uh, Mr. Rudnicki, please. Thank you, Chair Sundin, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Timothy Rudnicki, representing the Minnesota Biofuels Association, an organization uh, serving ethanol producers in the state of Minnesota. And uh, again, one little tag, we do more than that. We work literally with retailers and putting together promotion programs. We work with them to understand their infrastructure challenges for storing and dispensing fuels. And we also work with producers and wholesalers. So we, we kind of run the gamut there. I, I share that with you because I think it matters. It matters to know how the system and the process really works. And, and I think Representative Anderson really cued this up well. Um, I'm not gonna go through the metrics again for why this matters, but I'll simply say this. Um, the recommendations from the Governor's Council on Biofuels uh, sets forth some action, actionable items and it's, it's future looking. And that's great. Um, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, in cooperation with a lot of stakeholders a few years ago, ran a tremendous biofuel infrastructure partnership program. It is what has really set off this move so that now we have 395 retailers in the state of Minnesota offering E15. Uh, based on research from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, we, we probably need 660 before we get to a market penetration point. This bill, and the funding provides the, the bridge to literally get from here to the vision in the governor's council on biofuels recommendation. Um, there, in our estimation, are about 500, uh, 105 retailers that are ready and interested to take advantage of a grant program. And this bill helps accomplish what they need to do to offer E15 to Minnesotans. And I just wanna underscore one point um, that was made by Representative Hansen before, and that is, why does any of this matter? This is a, a relative, it's a lot of money. I, I get that. And there are a lot of pressing priorities, but this is one of the least cost options to immediately cut greenhouse gas emissions. And all you have to do is look out the window at the rolling stock on the highway. Those vehicles that are internal combustion engines and built after 2000 can use E15. There's no reason, there's no reason for them not to have a lower carbon fuel uh, to operate the only obstacle at this point is the uh, sometimes the minimal fixes that have to be done by retailers to be able to offer the fuel. So again, we strongly support House File 354 because it is the bridge from here to a greener future. Uh, thank you, Chair Sundin and members. Thank you, Mr. Rudnicki. Uh, the next uh, testifier would be uh, Mr. Gross again. Please uh, identify yourself again and uh, continue. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Again, Tim Gross with the Minnesota Petroleum Marketers Association. And I, um, I'd like to start my testimony by just correcting something that I misspoke that re relates directly to House File 354. Um, from the Governor's Biofuel Council, um, there were uh, identified 3,500 regulated UST facilities across Minnesota. And I want to be clear that 85% of those can today cannot prove compatibility with a higher ethanol fuel blend. So a bill like uh, Representative Anderson's is very important on that path to achieve that um, that proof of demonstration of compatibility. Um, we uh, are in support of this bill. We believe it's a very, it's a great first step in the, into this problem as in during the bio, uh, Governor's Biofuel Council, uh, we talked about the, the cost of this as a mountain of money. And this is a, this is a great first step in chipping away at that and in, in supporting a lot of the good uh, ideas that we talked about today. Um, like anything, uh, we've learned lessons from past federal programs and, and our neighbor to the south in Iowa, how these programs have worked. And um, though we, we agree with a lot, of, and also the amendment to the direction of going to smaller retailers, there are several ways of achieving that. And we'd love to work with the, the author and groups involved in the, even fine tuning this more um, to kind of uh, to make sure that these go to the, the, the right um, target. Um, existing sites right now and not new sites and and also looking at ways that um, that could that help the most retailers as possible like Tim has said um, one uh, one option that we also thought of of not segregating um, by sites because that's sometimes a hard measure to prove what a smaller or large retailer really is but to actually look at maybe putting a uh, like the federal program have, have a, a cap, a cap amount. But that cap amount be much less than the federal program where those dollars can be really spread out between all retail, retailers across the state. So again, Mr. Chair, thank you uh, and committee members for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any uh, questions uh, for the testifiers from the committee? Seeing none. Representative Anderson uh, renews his uh, motion that uh, House File 354 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus finance bill. And uh, thank you, Representative Anderson. This is a terrific bill and I thank you for carrying it. Uh, any final uh, words on it? Well, just uh, 354, Mr. Chair, is amended. It, just one little, one last comment. Uh, upgrading can range from just dis, uh, replacing the dispenser to a blender pump. I think the biggest uh, topic we need to look at is, is underground tanks, and that's the most expensive fix. You have to take up concrete, things like that. So um, that can be a pretty substantial cost. So we need to, to assist in, in programs such as that. And uh, Mr. Chair, this bill would do just that, uh, targeting it to uh, the smaller operations and uh, helping them to stay competitive. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would, uh, I would uh, move to lay this over as amended for possible inclusion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, House file 354 as amended is laid over. Next, we have a brief report from uh, the department on uh, bio incentives uh, a report. Bob Patton, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and begin. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Again, I'm Bob Patton. I'm uh, Energy and Environment Supervisor in the Ag Marketing and Development Division of Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And thank you for getting my slides up. Oh, uh, there they are. Thank you very much. Uh, if you, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief overview of this report. Uh, first of all, just a, a refresher on the program itself. The bioincentive program resulted from 2015 legislation, and it was modeled after the uh, ethanol producer payment program that ran from uh, 1986 to 2012. Uh, the producer incentives are to encourage commercial scale production of advanced biofuel, renewable chemicals, and biomass thermal energy. Next slide, please. Uh, the payments are after the fact, therefore, uh, production that has occurred. And so producers certify their production to us and we pay by units of energy, millions of bridge thermal units, or in the case of renewable chemicals, we pay 
per pound of renewable chemical. Next slide, please. Um, here, uh, there are yearly maximums per production type. And next slide, please. I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly. Uh, and yearly maximum payments per facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, appropriations uh, started off with 500,000 in the first year um, and went up to 1.5 million for uh, through the 2018-2019 uh, biennium, uh, raised to 2.5 million uh, for the current biennium and next biennium are scheduled to go up to $3 million. I will note, and I'll, I'll cover it uh, briefly later on that we do have a, a budget request to increase that. Next slide, please. This is the history of the program. Uh, from the beginning, it, it was a, a slow start. We had surplus money uh, that went uh, back into the agri, uh, our agri grant programs. Uh, but by uh, fiscal year 19, the program uh, use of the program grew to the extent that we were uh, surpassing the amount of money in the fund by uh, almost $27,000. Uh, next slide, please. You can see that this biennium, uh, we uh, topped out the um, we we topped out the 2.5 million in the first two quarters, and so uh, the the uh, that left uh, about three million dollars on the table. Uh, excuse me, um, I, I can't. Yeah, four uh, four hundred thousand uh, dollars on the table. Uh, for, uh, er, excuse me, you, you advanced to the next slide. Uh, yes, uh, I'm just trying to look at my number there. Um, excuse me. Uh, yes, oh, it was almost $3 million in, uh, uh, for this biennium. And for, uh, uh, for the last biennium and the current biennium, we have uh, 400,000. Uh, we have cut capped out uh, after the first two quarters here as well. And we keep track of, uh, we still have uh, companies make claims even when we don't have money because we wanna keep track of what the demand is. Uh, so uh, we do fully expect that we'll be uh, probably in the, the four to $5 million range of shortfall by the time we get to the end of the fiscal year. Um, next slide, please. We uh, have a budget request for uh, $750,000. So it, it would bring the uh, total appropriation to $3.75 million. Uh, we fully realize that this uh, will reduce but not eliminate the shortfall. And with that, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Patton. Are there any questions to Mr. Patton? on that presentation. Okay, seeing none, uh, boy, do I have a bill for you. Uh, Vice Chair Vang, uh, would you assume the gavel, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Setting, please uh, move your bill and feel free to begin. And I move House File 804 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus ag finance bill. Uh, you, you heard uh, from uh, Mr. Patton about uh, how well used this program is and how underfunded it actually is. And uh, just to review a little bit, uh, the uh, buy incentive program was established in 2015 by the Minnesota legislature to attract new investments in advanced biofuel renewable chemical and biomass thermal energy in Minnesota. The program is performance-based and companies are only compensated for actual production. Because the state only pays for performance, the program is boondoggle proof and the state takes on no technology or investment risk. As a sign of the program's success, claims in the program have increased as we've seen. The means in the, that the program this means that the program has already attracted significant new investment in Minnesota, leading to new jobs and economic activity. Continued economic growth in this sector depends on the state keeping up its end of the bargain. Companies made investments assuming the program would be there for them. 
if the industry feels that the state is not committed to the program, future investments are less likely. The bio incentive supports industries such as ethanol and forest product industry. They're particularly hard hit by the current COVID crisis and are experiencing difficulty even before that. Failing to make good on promises, promised payments would be another blow during a tough time. Economic impact in study by the uh, University of Minnesota extension uh, demonstrates uh, a strong on strong return on investment for the state of Minnesota for this program. What is needed? The, pro, the Department of Agriculture projects the level of funding that will be needed for the biennium based on the communication with companies planning to commence or continue production. The program will have a shortfall of $5 million by the end of the current fiscal year and will need approximately $10 million more per year in future years. The bill addresses this uh, 5 million in the first year and then uh, 10 each in, uh, following. So uh, with me today, I have uh, Bridget Tuck from the University of Minnesota to uh, pitch in on uh, the value of this program. Uh, I see the first testifier is Ms. Tuck from the U of M. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Bridget Tuck. I'm with University of Minnesota Extension and I'm gonna share my slides with you if that is okay. Um, so as I said, my name is Bridget Tuck and I work across the state of Minnesota uh, with communities trying to help them really understand their economies and how their economies work. And in doing that work, I was able to partner with the Great Plains Institute and the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota to measure what the economic impact of um, the bio-based industrial products industry in Minnesota is. Um, so as you know, in 2015, the tax incentive was passed and then we were able to look at what actually happened in 2019. Um, so we looked at two separate phases. We looked at the construction. So what was the impact? A lot of the facilities either had to do retrofit their current facility or do new construction in order to expand for their bio-based product line. So we measured that. And then we also looked at the economic impact of operations. So that's that annual ongoing impact that will continue on into the future uh, as long as they produce at these levels. Um, so we surveyed all 12 companies that either have received the credit or are going to re or were eligible to receive the credit, and we got responses from 10. So this data is fairly robust. Um, we look at what we consider the direct impact. So that is the spending by the companies themselves to operate. And then we look at those indirect and induced or what we call ripple effects. So what are those additional impacts that are occurring in the economy? So the indirect effects are those associated with spending for supplies. So um, because these companies are out making purchases, that's in causing their suppliers to have to increase their economic activity. And then we also look at the induce, which are related to the labor impact. So the spending out there uh, because people have paychecks and, and they're um, you know, making their mortgage payments and buying groceries and those things. So I just have a couple of slides to give you a quick overview of the results. You do have the full report if you ever feel like digging into the details. Um, so on the construction phase, um, the companies reported spending 690.5 million to do either those retrofits or new building. And we found that that generated $1.2 billion in economic activity across the state of Minnesota. The activity supported 8,325 jobs. And we economists like to argue maybe the most important piece is that labor income or money to the residents of the state of Minnesota to the tune of 540.6 million. And again, that was just that construction impact that is short term, you know, as soon as the construction is done, you see those uh, effects start to dissipate. Uh, but then we also looked at the operating contribution. So again, this would be an annual impact. Uh, we found that the companies spend $438.8 million on purchases within the state of Minnesota. Um, and this generated in total $610.7 million worth of economic activity in Minnesota. It supported 2,415 jobs. And again, on that labor income metric, $127 million worth of labor income. So what we really wanted to see is kind of how does that stack up against the investment that the state of Minnesota is making? Um, so in 2019, as, as stated, the state appropriation was 1.5 million. Um, if you just look at that operations piece, uh, there was $610.7 million worth of economic activity generated across the state. 
thus for every dollar the state is investing, um, there's $407.10 worth of economic activity created in Minnesota. And then we looked at the tax or tax revenues and tax collections. Um, so we could see what the state and local tax collections would be based on those um, direct and indirect and ripple effects. And so we found for every dollar of state investment, you're actually getting uh, $8.90 in state and local tax uh, revenues or receipts back. Um, again, for every dollar you put in, you're getting $8.90 back in actual tax collections. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. And I think I'll stand for questions. Uh, I believe there's another testifier. So maybe after that. Thank you. Yeah, we can go through the testifiers first and then we can, um, I can open up the floor for, for questions. The next testifier I see is um, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. My name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I'm a vice president uh, overseeing transportation and fuel programs at the Great Plains Institute, and I serve as a facilitator for the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota. The Bioeconomy Coalition is a, is a partnership of uh, advanced biofuel producers, bio-based chemical producers, uh, and uh, other, other parts of the bioeconomy. Um, our coalition is a statewide partnership that uh, initially supported the, the passage of the bioincentive program in 2015. And uh, we're very grateful to uh, see this bill. Uh, thank you, Representative Sundin, and uh, grateful to the Department of Ag for including uh, increased funding for the bioincentive program and the, well, sorry, for the to the council, I should I should say, to uh, recommending this and to the department for including this as a budget request. Um, the uh, bioincentive program is, as uh, Bridget Tuck illustrated, uh, really providing a strong return on investment for the state of Minnesota, uh, leading to uh, a lot of uh, you know, again new investment and jobs impact. It really is a statewide program uh, with uh, projects ranging from. Uh, cellulosic biofuel production at existing ethanol plants to move towards uh, you know advanced biofuel production, uh, bio-based chemical production to help diversify and and make more sustainable over time our forest products industry. It's providing a critical role in creating a market for residuals from uh, some of our existing forest products mills, a much needed market. Um, there were some great questions before about equity implications of programs, and I just thought I would add that uh, you know there's significant investment in a couple of these facilities from tribal communities, including uh, Coda Energy and uh, uh, a project at the the Fond du Lac Band, and uh, you know I. I think this program complements very well a number of the other proposals you've seen today related to uh, investing in higher blends and distribution of higher blends of biofuels. And this, this uh, really helps support, you know, develop, developing the next generation of uh, advanced biofuels and bio-based chemicals uh, to further displace uh, petroleum-based uh, fuels and products in Minnesota. Uh, Madam Chair, that's the, the, the end of my testimony. Of course, happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I don't see any further testifiers, so uh, I can open up the floor for members, uh, if members have questions or comments. Okay, seeing no further discussion, uh, any closing, oh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question uh, about the retroactive nature of the appropriation. Um, Mr. Chair, or um, are you able to answer Representative Hansen's question? What was the question, actually? Representative Hansen. The bill has some uh, retroactive appropriations back to January of 2020, I think. Uh, maybe sure. Mr. Jordan can answer that or. Sure, there's, um, thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Hansen. Uh, the, uh, that addresses that shortfall. Some of those uh, uh, entities that have applied uh, for the incentive that uh, weren't uh, fully funded, I guess is the way to put it, uh, uh, would be eligible to reach back for some of this funding. So that's all it is, is, you know, the promise has been made to these uh, uh, people and uh, this is a way to fulfill that, that promise. 
Uh, Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just got a quick question for Mr. Jordan or uh, probably Mr. Jordan. I'm, I'm curious on the advanced biofuels piece and, and cellulosic uh, ethanol in particular. There's already markets for you know forest byproducts in our industry, on uh, in the turf industry and poultry for, for litter bedding materials. And once again, my concerns are, you know, as mandates are in place, um, we're competing for those products. Um, what kind of volumes are we talking about when we talk about these cellulosic advanced biofuels? Mr. Jordan. Madam Chair and Representative, uh, the, the production that's occurring today in, in, in terms of advanced biofuels is primarily uh, cellulose, it's so-called corn kernel cellulosic ethanol. There, there may be, uh, I, I wish Poet was still here because uh, Poet is one of the plants that, that does this, but it's, it's actually, you know, so there's a certain percentage of the kernel of corn that goes into an ethanol plant that is, you know, essentially biomass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the process seeks to extract an advanced biofuel cellulosic ethanol from that, from that corn kernel. I don't mm -hmm. believe it impacts the ability to produce uh, distiller's grains. Um, so I, I'm not sure it would have a, a lot of impact on existing markets. I should also add to uh, representative uh, related to the question about mandates. This is an incentive, you know, a, a performance-based incentive program, uh, not, not a mandate of any kind. Mm -hmm. Follow Nothing up representative further. Perko? Thank, no, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? Uh, seeing no further discussion, then any closing comments, Chair Sending, before you? Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have some closing comments. Uh, you can see that this is a terrific program. It's uh, woefully underfunded. Uh, the governor has addressed that in his bill, uh, but uh, this one uh, goes it, uh, brings it to the uh, a level where it's uh, meaningful uh, going forward here. So. Uh, uh, I guess rather than lay it over, uh, during the committee here, I've got input that uh, the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee would like to see this as well. So um, I'd like to see this well vetted, vetted if they uh, have an interest in it. I would uh, much rather have the uh, uh, support of this committee uh, with its uh, send it on to the uh, Climate and Energy Finance Committee with the recommendation of this committee. Okay. Um, that would be Mr. my motion. Mr. Chair, we knew uh, his motion to have House File 804 uh, be uh, sent over to uh, Climate, Climate and Energy, Energy. Um, Committee. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Smith, um, staff, perhaps you can help me with this. I'm assuming we will be taking a vote on this. Yeah. Uh, Chair Sundin. Aye. Sundin votes aye. Vice Chair Vang. Aye. Vang votes aye. Anderson. Anderson votes aye. Anderson aye. Burkle. Aye. Burkle aye. Eckland. Aye. Eckland aye. Hanson R. Hanson R. No. Hanson R. No. Hanson J. Hanson J. I think I missed that. Hanson J. Hanson J. Yes. Hanson J. I. Cleveland. Pass. Cleveland. Pass. Um, Lippert. Lippert. I. Lippert. I. Lewick. Lewick. I. Lewick. I. Miller. Miller. I. Miller. I. Nelson. 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 I. Nelson. I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. All right. I'm seeing 11 eyes, one nay, and one pass. And with that, uh, the motion prevails and onwards to uh, Climate and Energy Committee. Thank, um, you, thank, sure. thank you, Chair Sending Testifier. Um, any, uh, that is our last item of the agenda. Any announcements, Chair Sending, before we adjourn? Uh, just uh, another note on this particular bill, 804 will be returning to us, uh, returning to the Ag Committee. So we'll, uh, you haven't seen the last of it. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, next meeting is next Monday, March 1st, and meeting is adjourned.